SpaceX passed the threshold of more than 2,000 Starlink satellites launched after a Falcon 9 rocket placed another set of broadband internet spacecraft into orbit on January 18. A two-stage SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket topped with 49 Starlink satellites lifted off from NASA's Kennedy Space Center last Tuesday at 9.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. About nine minutes later, the rocket's first stage came down to Earth for a pinpoint touchdown on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the tenth successful landing for this particular booster. Meanwhile, the Falcon 9's second stage continued to power its way into orbit, eventually deploying the 49 satellites about 15 minutes after launch. The second stage was out of range of ground stations when that happened, so confirmation of deployment didn't come until about an hour later. The launch was SpaceX's 36th Starlink mission, and it brought the total number of Starlink satellites to 2042. Most of the Starlink satellites are alive and well. Tuesday's mission, dubbed Starlink Group 46, is the fifth launch to Starlink shell number 5. An estimated 30 additional launches will be needed to fill this shell, which is part of the five orbital shells required to complete this first phase of the constellation. According to Federal Communications Commission, the entire constellation will not be complete until 42,000 Starlink satellites are orbiting the planet. NASA has updated the status of SpaceX's next two crewed Falcon 9 launches, one fully private Axiom mission, and the other the Crew-4 mission for the space agency. According to NASA, the AX-1 Crew Dragon mission to the International Space Station has been delayed a month to account for additional spacecraft preparations and space station traffic. The flight has been pushed back from February 21 to March 31, and it will send four people to the ISS for an eight-day stay. The crew includes Michael Lopez Alegria, a professionally trained astronaut hired by Axiom Space, Aiton Stibb from Israel, Larry Connor from the United States, and Mark Pathy from Canada, each paying $55 million for their trip. Once aboard the orbiting laboratory, the crew will conduct science, outreach, and commercial activities for eight days before returning to Earth. NASA Commercial Crew Program Manager Steve Stitch says that SpaceX's next NASA astronaut mission, Crew-4, will launch atop a thrice-flown rocket. Crew-4 will be SpaceX's fourth operational astronaut launch for NASA and is scheduled to lift off no earlier than April 15, with a new Crew Dragon capsule and thrice-flown Falcon 9 booster, B-1067. The mission will carry three NASA astronauts and one ESA astronaut to the space station. United Launch Alliance launched its first and only Atlas V rocket with a 511 configuration into orbit on Friday, carrying two satellites for the United States Space Force. The Atlas V lifted off from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on 21 January at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, carrying two identical geosynchronous space situational awareness program satellites to orbit. Launching in a 511 configuration, the rocket sported a 5 meters wide payload fairing, one solid rocket booster attached to the base, and a single RL-10C engine on its Centaur upper stage. According to CEO Tori Bruno, this unique configuration was needed to provide just the right amount of thrust to deliver the two spacecraft into a near-geosynchronous orbit. This is just the right amount of energy to carry these two payloads to their very cool mission of space surveillance, kind of like a neighborhood watch for GEO. This is the only Atlas V to fly in the 511 configuration, because the vehicle is set to be replaced by the company's Vulcan rocket, which is expected to debut later this year or early next year. The two satellites on board for the USS F-8 mission were the fifth and sixth GSSAP spacecraft to take flight. The first two pairs of satellites were launched in 2014 and 2016 on Delta IV medium rockets. These satellites provide neighborhood watch services in the geosynchronous Earth orbit, improving flight safety for all spacefaring nations operating in that orbit. Enhanced position knowledge of satellites at that distance enhances the ability to warn a spacecraft operator if there is another object anticipated to approach too closely and create a hazardous situation. The spacecrafts were deployed from the launch vehicle about 6 hours 35 minutes and 6 hours 45 minutes after liftoff into a near-geosynchronous orbit approximately 36,000 kilometers above the equator. To date, ULA has launched 148 times with 100% mission success, and Friday's launch was the 91st launch of the Atlas V rocket. Russian cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov successfully completed a spacewalk outside the International Space Station on January 19 to outfit Russia's new Nauka and Pritchell modules. During their 7 hours and 11 minutes long spacewalk, the cosmonauts installed handrails, rendezvous antennas, a television camera, and docking targets on the Pritchell docking module, which automatically docked to the Nauka Multipurpose Laboratory module in November 2021. 
Pritchell serves as a port where Russian Soyuz spacecraft carrying people can dock. The first such mission in March will carry three cosmonauts to the space station. The spacewalk on Wednesday was the first of the year and the 246th overall in support of space station assembly, maintenance, and upgrades. Additional spacewalks are planned this spring to outfit a European robotic arm on the NACA laboratory and to activate NACA's airlock for future spacewalk activities. On Sunday, January 23, SpaceX's Dragon CRS-24 cargo ship undocked itself from the International Space Station's Harmony module for its return journey to Earth. The spacecraft is filled with more than 2,000 kilograms of valuable scientific experiments and other cargo to return to Earth. Once the spacecraft arrives on Earth, time-sensitive cargo, such as biological research samples, will be flown back to Kennedy Space Center by helicopter, where NASA researchers will receive and catalog the materials for analysis and distribution to scientists around the world. The Dragon is carrying a spacesuit back to Earth with it for refurbishment, after supporting spacewalks outside the space station. Also on board is a 12-year-old light imaging microscope that is being retired after more than a decade of use studying the structure of matter and plants in orbit. Dragon will initiate a deorbit burn on Monday, January 24, to begin its re-entry sequence into Earth's atmosphere, then make a parachute-assisted splashdown about 4.05 p.m. EDT off the coast of Florida. After nearly a whole month in space, the James Webb Space Telescope has completed the deployment of the Space Telescope's mirror segments. The primary mirror of the James Webb Telescope comprises 18 hexagonal segments of gold-plated beryllium metal, each controlled by seven actuators that allow precise movements. When all segments are aligned, the mirror measures 6.5 meters in diameter. Work began on the mirror segments on January 12, when the Webb team began moving the observatory's individual mirror segments out of their launch positions. Electric motors on board the observatory made over a million revolutions during the deployment process to move 132 actuators to clear the mirrors from their launch restraints. All of these deployment steps have taken place while Webb cruises toward its final destination, a gravitationally stable spot about 1.5 million kilometers from our planet, called the Earth-Sun Lagrange Point. Next, NASA must conduct the painstaking process of fine-tuning every mirror's position to turn 18 individual views of the universe into one large ultra-powerful mirror. The team behind Webb expects that the entire mirror process will take about three months. Ground teams are currently planning to fire Webb's thrusters at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday, January 24, to insert the space telescope into orbit around the Sun at the second Lagrange point. Once Webb reaches its destination, rocket engines aboard it will use thrust about every three weeks to keep it looping around L2 in a halo orbit every six months. Once in orbit around L2, Webb's optics and instruments will undergo more months of fine-tuning and testing before the historically powerful space telescope begins peering deep into the distant reaches of time and space. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Recently, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk shared a video showcasing the super-heavy booster catching arms moving up through the orbital launch tower and an official render of how the Starship launch tower will catch the gigantic super-heavy rocket. The video showed how the claw-like catching arms would catch the rocket with load points just below the grid fins and shock absorbers built into the tower arms. However, the simulation he shared also raises some questions. Musk proposed catching starships and super-heavy boosters out of the sky as an alternative to landing legs. This was a significant departure from SpaceX's highly successful Falcon family, which lands on a relatively complex set of deployable legs. The flexible lightweight structures have mostly been reliable and easily reusable, but Falcon boosters occasionally have rough landings, damaging the legs and making boosters hard to safely recover and slower to reuse. Furthermore, adding landing legs to a launch vehicle reduces its payload capability. So, as part of an effort to simplify the Starship and its Super Heavy booster and increase payload capability, SpaceX intends to catch Super Heavy boosters and possibly Starships in mid-air. But based on the simulation of a super heavy catch Musk shared on January 20, all that effort may end up producing a solution that is actually worse than what it is attempting to replace. According to the simulated telemetry shown in the visualization, Super Heavy's descent to the landing zone appears to be much gentler than the suicide burn SpaceX routinely employs on Falcon rockets. Igniting just the center Merlin engine of the rocket, Falcon 9 saves a significant amount of propellant during recovery by decelerating as quickly as possible and keeping landing burns as short as possible. The payload capability of the Falcon 9 will be increased as a result of this. In the case of the Super Heavy booster, the landing burn starts at an altitude of 1.8 kilometers, igniting all 13 Raptor center engines on the vehicle for approximately 6 seconds. 
Then at an altitude of about 800 meters, the vehicle switches to three engines and descends into an incredibly small steel patch on the catching arms. For comparison, usually during an ocean landing, Falcon 9 landing burn begins at the same 1.8 kilometers altitude, but for a land landing, Merlin ignition begins at an altitude of 4.6 kilometers, as the vehicle will be at a higher velocity during this phase, and thus needs to shed much more velocity before landing compared to an ocean landing. In the SpaceX simulation, apart from a tiny bit of lateral motion, the arms appear motionless during the super heavy catch, making it more of a landing than a catching. Furthermore, Super Heavy is shown decelerating slowly throughout the simulation and hovering for nearly 5 to 7 seconds near the end. That slow cautious descent, and even slower touchdown, may be necessary because of how incredibly accurate Super Heavy has to be to land on a pair of hardpoints, with inches of lateral margin for error. But the problem is that the slow descent and final hover would almost certainly require significantly more propellant than a Falcon-style suicide burn, reducing the payload capability of the Starship launch system. Super Heavy would most likely need to burn at least 5 to 10 tons more to land on arms, and SpaceX could probably quite easily add simple and reliable legs to Super Heavy, thus removing most of the bad aspects of Falcon's legs. Even if those legs weigh a total of 20 tons, this would only reduce the rocket's payload to orbit by a small fraction, but it will certainly eliminate the complex and risky mid-air catching procedure. Landing on the arms, according to Musk, would increase the speed of reuse and allow for an immediate reflight. This argument makes sense when considering the fact that the time spent inspecting landing legs and associated mechanisms could be saved in the event of a mid-air catch. Furthermore, landing on the arms would clearly eliminate the need to reattach the arms to a landed booster or ship for stacking, saving more than a few minutes of work. Currently, SpaceX's Falcon booster turnaround record is 27 days, so it's hard to understand why the company would be concerned about saving minutes or hours of the turnaround of a Starship system. In short, while the launch tower arms will undoubtedly be helpful for quickly lifting and stacking Super Heavy and Starship, the official SpaceX render suggests that using those arms as a landing platform will be a pretty mediocre alternative to basic Falcon-style landings. More importantly, even if everything works flawlessly, the apparent best possible outcome of all that effort is marginally faster reuse and possibly a fractional increase in the payload to orbit. So, by considering these factors, do you think mid-air rocket catching is a better alternative to landing legs? Let us know in the comments below. Moving on to other Starship updates, on January 14, the US Air Force awarded SpaceX a $102 million contract to demonstrate technologies to transport cargo for humanitarian aid and disaster relief. The program, dubbed Rocket Cargo, is part of a collaboration between the United States Space Force and the Air Force Research Laboratory to develop heavy-lift commercial rockets to transport cargo to point-to-point -point destinations on Earth. The public contract award announcement does not specify which rocket ship SpaceX intends to use, however, the Air Force website includes an image of a vehicle that resembles a Starship. Work on Starship 20 and Super Heavy Booster 4 is in progress at the Starbase launch site. The installation of the aero cover on Booster 4 is now complete, indicating that the vehicle is getting ready for a static fire test campaign. The aero covers will shield the vehicle's hydraulic systems, pressure vessels, avionics, and heat exchangers from the shockwave and debris generated during the upcoming 29-engine static fire test. Aero covers will also safeguard the systems during an actual flight and when the booster performs a hypersonic re-entry. It's unclear when Booster 4 will return to the orbital launch mount for wet dress rehearsal and static fire testing. SpaceX has ambiguous test windows scheduled from Monday to Friday. On Saturday, Ship 20 was removed from suborbital launch pad B and placed on a transport stand before being moved close to the orbital launch pad on Sunday. GSE Tank 4 was subjected to a liquid nitrogen cryo test to failure on January 18 to validate the construction methods. Whether that failure was intentional or not remains a mystery. The stabilization arms on the catching arms were put into a test last Wednesday. These arms will connect to the ship and the booster during lifting and after mid-air catching to stabilize the launch vehicles. Raptor version 2 engine tests are progressing at the SpaceX McGregor test facility. A test on January 14 saw one of such engines emitting volumes of exhaust for 24 seconds before starting to throw out green flames. The green flames are caused by the melting of the copper components inside the engine due to some malfunction. A similar green flame can be seen during the landing burn of Starship SN8 during its high-altitude test in December 2020. Such an event takes place when there is insufficient fuel in an engine's combustion chamber, which results in excess oxygen melting the innards. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. 
Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.